I've known John DeVore since the mid 2000s when he still lived on the Lower East Side and his speakers had yet to attain the lofty status in the hi fi world they currently enjoy. John's speakers have always had a signature sound clean, sweet, and warm, particularly my 093 floor standards. I've also owned John's Gibbon 8, Super 8, and the 9s models, all of which had a particular DeVore sound. John's workshop and famous monkey house are in the old Brooklyn Navy Yard. When John moved in, it was still largely a derelict ruin with large, empty workspaces and abandoned warehouses. It was truly a beautiful place to someone like me who sees ruins as art. Now it's a state-of-the-art made in Brooklyn complex, but there are still a few old buildings around if you know where to look, and there's also a Wegmans and pretty cool hipster bar. John is also a musician and has very wide musical taste. I asked him for his top 10 jazz LPs, and he came up with 11 and a 45. first <laughs> jazz record I ever owned, uh, and I'm not sure how I got it, I, I mean I'm sure I got it from my parents, they must have had it, uh, is a 45 of Cannibal Adderley doing the Joseph Zalnu tool, uh, Mercy, 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 uh, and on the other side it's games. And I loved this, I played this so much, and I remember it, it goes back far enough that I remember playing it on my little plat white plastic turntable that had a plastic lid and a bright orange tonar. I was a hi-fi nut very early, so that means this was really early. Maybe I was six or seven? Hmm. I mean, early, 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 and I played this so much. I loved this. It's on a live album. These are, these are, these are live takes, uh, and it's a great tune. Um, it's an absolutely great tune, it's very soulful. So this definitely shaped things to come for me. I was just uh, lucky or having, you know, parents with good taste in music that uh, that it showed up on my little white plastic turntable. I mean, I heard there was jazz being played in my house all the time. This was the introduction to jazz that, that I dove deep in. And I would play it and my eyes would be closed and I would be imagining all the instruments as they were as they were coming and I got to know this inside and out because I just played it over huh. and over and over wow. and there was a few records when I had when I was a kid that I had and this was one of them this is probably one of you know three or four records that I that just saturated and so I it really was it was it was diving deep I loved it I still love it Uh, the next one also is from freshman year at uh, at school at RISD. Herbie Hancock released an album just before I got to RISD called called Future Shock, and there was a the single off of that is called Rocket, and it was all over the radio. A good friend of mine, uh, well, I met him freshman year, and this was still freshman year, but we ended up rooming together for for the next three years, um, and he's a, a good friend of mine to this day. We bonded immediately on music and, and hi-fi. He was a hi-fi, he was a, an audiophile as well. And he loved Rocket, and he was talking about what a, what, he, what a genius Herbie Hancock was. And I didn't know who, who her, for me, Herbie Hancock was the guy who did Rocket. And I was like, I don't know, I mean, the turntabling stuff is kind of lame. Okay. And I was like, all right, let me listen to the rest of the album. So he loaned me the rest of the album. I play the record and I'm like, corny. I'm like, future shock. And it's like, this, <laughs> you know, this is their guy. This is your genius. Right. And he was like, all right, shut up. He took me into his room, digging all the way in the back of one of his record crates, pulls out this record uh -huh. and cues it up to Watermelon Man. And that first thing, boop, boop, my mind was blown. I was just like, what is this? Right. It was like, it was like nothing I had ever heard. And this whole album is just so killer. It's so funky. It's like the, the instrumentation is different from anything else. It's just, it is a badass 
record. Again, impressively funky. The songs are fantastic. I mean, a lot of some of these songs are are he did in a much more straightforward way on other albums. But on this, it, they're just transformed. That same friend, I mean, he was, I didn't listen to Fusion. For me, Fusion was just kind of weird. And he was all into like Return to Forever and Weather Report. And, and he played me, you know, Miles Davis decoy. And, and he sort of got me into some of that stuff. But this is the one that just lit the fuse. And yeah, it just blew me away. Yeah, this is an old one. That's the famous Nice Price. It's also on tape too. Oh. That is a tape, that's what tapes, <laughs> that's a cassette tape. If we talk about that first song, water, or the second song, Watermelon Man, that buildup, you know, it starts with the, the hooting and hollering and the shakers and the, and the flutes and stuff like that. The way he slips in underneath the beat and comes in and locks it all together. I mean, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Beautiful stuff. I wasn't a drummer at the time. I mean, uh, I, I'm not a drummer now. I'm a, I'm a self half taught, um, you know, rock drummer from the East Village in the nineties. Uh, so this was way before any of that. And, um, but I was, I was actually the guy when my friends and I would get together and listen to uh, Zeppelin or something like that on my hi-fi really loud, I would always do air drums. I would always play the bottom parts, you know, let them play the, let them battle over who gets guitar. But yeah, this is, this, this one, man. There she is, Here's the sweet bear. This one, a uh, song for my father, uh, also in Spanish, but I'm not going to try to pronounce the Spanish version. Uh, and the title track is the is the one that uh, Steely Dan ripped off uh, for their intro to uh, Ricky Don't Lose That M Number. And um, this was I th this is sort of the first jazz record I ever got that has uh, a little bit of the the Latin flavor to it. Um, it's not a lot. I mean, it's not like some of the Dizzy stuff or any of the actual Latin players. It has got such a good groove all the way through. The, even the, the slow pieces on here are beautiful, but the uh, the title track song for my father, the, um, it's just, it's an amazing, you know, the first time I heard this record, uh, I probably played it three times in a row. It was just it, catchy, great, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't. Uh, but it's just, it's such a it's a keeper and it's catchy. Everyone would love this. It's the uh, it's an easy one. It's not it's not a difficult one like even maybe the Mingus. So do you still like Steely Dan? Yeah, absolutely. The Steely Dan track, it, even Ricky Don't Lose That Number, is still one of my favorite Steely tracks, and it's off a great Steely album. Song for my father is better. <laughs> 